So finally we come to it. The first principles differentiation of sine and cosine. In parts 1 and 2 we developed two of the tools that we will need. Two limits. Let's write them down as a reminder. We might also need to remind ourselves about the formula for doing first principles differentiation. The derivative for a function f of x we can call f primed of x. It's defined as a limit. We picture drawing a tangent at the point x f of x to the graph of the curve of y equals f of x. We then measure the rise and the run along that tangent and take the limit as the run tends to zero. We can write that as f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h where the run has been called h. Sometimes people use delta x instead of h but it's all the same. It's this limit we're interested in. I'm going to look in detail at the function f of x equals sine x. At the end, if there's time, I'll then sketch how it goes for cos x, but I'll leave you to fill in the details. So there's f of x, and f primed of x is going to be the limit just as above, and we now need to use sine of x for the function f. There it is. To get further, I need the formula for the sine of the sum of two angles, because of that first term, sine of x plus h. If you need to revise this, you'll find some maths casts by me on the sums and differences of angles within a sine or a cos. I'm just going to quote the one that we need here, sine of x plus h. For sine of a sum of angles, the right-hand side takes the form sine cos plus cos sine with the respective angles in those trig functions. So here, sine x cos h plus cos x sine h. Don't get that cos h and sin h kind of confused with hyperbolic functions. These are still definitely trig functions. So I'm going to substitute that right-hand side now into the black limit immediately above. So that's the substitution done, and I still have to put a minus sin x and bring it down from where it is above. Now, anything with x in it does not depend on h. So the limit will not care about factors of sin x or cos x. They can be pulled out to the front of the limit. This expression looks quite complicated, but I can make it a lot simpler by breaking it into the part with sin x only and the part with cos x only, and at the same time pulling the sin x and the cos x out to the front. So I'm going to collect it in this way. We just need to fill in the missing spaces in the brackets. Let's look at the cos x bit first. There's only one term with cos x. It's cos x sine h over h. So in that limit, we simply have to put sine h over h. That's done, so I can tick that term off and forget about it. Now the part with sine x in. There are two bits. They've both got h underneath, but on top there is sin x cos h and there is minus sin x. Since we're taking the sin x as a factor out the front, all we have to write in the bracket now is cos h minus 1. Well, we're there. We can evaluate these limits. The second one, sin h over h, is exactly the limit that we evaluated in part 1. It takes the value 1. The other one, cos h minus 1 over h, well, actually that's the opposite way round to the one we evaluated in part 2, isn't it? We did the limit 1 minus cos h over h. We also, by the way, of course, called the variable x, but the name doesn't matter. It's still tending to 0. There were those limits, remember? You see, 1 minus cos x over x. But the limit we've actually got, cos h minus 1 over h, is only the negative of that. And the negative of 0 is still 0. So the limit is 0. Putting all of that together means we can drop the first term completely. There is no sin x. And the coefficient of cos x is just 1. 
So we have our derivative. f prime of x is 1 cos x, or just cos x. We have now successfully derived sine x. The derivative of sine x is cos x. It works in a very similar way for finding the derivative of cos. I'll just start it off and give you a little push in the right direction. The first principles formula works just in the same way. The only difference is that we've got cos there instead of sine. That means that we will need the sum formula for cos. Cos of x plus h. You could look it up, but I'll tell you what it is here. Cos of x plus h is cos x cos h minus, yes that is a minus, it's not a slip, sine x sine h. Use that sum formula in the limit that I've just written. Collect cos x and sine x outside of their respective limits. Use the same limiting values that we've already been using and you should find that f primed comes to a negative sine x. I'll leave it for you to complete that. Well, that's it. We've got there. I'm, I'm almost finished. There is going to be another part to this set of maths casts. All of this material that we've done here relies on x being measured in radians. The limits relied on x being measured in radians. That means that these derivatives of sine and cos are also only valid if x is measured in radians. If you try and use degrees for your angle and do calculus, you will end up getting wrong results. It is crucially important that you always use radians if there is the slightest hint of either differentiation or integration in the atmosphere. OK, I'll finish there for now. I'll see you in part four.